hostages a continent away. They told us it was an impossible mission. It's good for James Bond. 48 hours to strategize. It's as good as a plan as it gets. We didn't have any option. 60 minutes to make it happen. This airplane will never take off. Go, go, go! And 10 men reveal for the first time the secrets behind the greatest hostage rescue in history. Israel, June 27, 1976. As the country starts its day, information about a developing crisis reaches its special ops team in Tel Aviv. It was Sunday morning, and I was at my office, and they said the aircraft with many Israelis was hijacked. I got a call from Ehud Barak, who asked me to come to his office in the IDF headquarters. When I arrived, there were four other intelligence and Air Force officers there. Okay, let's get to work. An Air France flight originating in Tel Aviv and bound for Paris has been hijacked by four terrorists. We learned there is about 250 passengers, and many of them are Israelis. The hijackers identified themselves as two members of the German urban terrorist organization, the Bader Meinhof Gang, and two from the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. They had guns, hand grenades, and possibly bombs. They meant business. At this point, the whereabouts of the plane is not known. So the first day and the first night was just trying to track this aircraft. Then, early next morning, they get Hello. word about the missing aircraft. They found the plane. Ethel. And Tebe. And Tebe. My first reaction was, where the hell is Antebe? I don't know, somewhere in Africa. I didn't know where is Antebe. But I knew where Antebe was. It was in Uganda. I was there in the early 70s, training their paratroopers. Get me a map. So I sent an officer when the shops opened and we found some old maps of Uganda. Today you get it from internet, but in that time it was published. And we measured the distance and it was so far from Israel. It was about 5,000 kilometers, 3,000 miles. How would we even get in there? This was a unique situation because it was so far away. Nobody took into account that one day we shall have to fly to Uganda. We don't have plan to go to Uganda or to the North Pole. Okay. It's 10 times further than we've gone before. Suppose we have to find a way to get there. How do we do it? But before the team can respond, they're interrupted by breaking news. Uganda's dictator, Idi Amin, has arrived at the Entebbe airport. Idi Amin hasn't changed a bit. Idi Amin appeared escorted by a lot of media people. Still playing the big shot every time he walks by a camera. We knew about Idi Amin. He was a media whore. He loved being in the public eye. With an ego as big as his body, Idi Amin is suddenly in the center of world attention, a position he has never sought to avoid. And so it made sense to us that he would spontaneously let the plane land in Entebbe. The crisis gave him a form. He wanted to be the one who solved the standoff. As I watched him addressing the hostages, I realized they'd been moved from the plane. Oh, see that? That's the building. I recognize that place. Been there hundreds of times. I identified that they were in the old terminal. Sure that it is. Over the next night, the team picks Betcher's brain. I knew the basics of the structure and the area around it. So when was that? Five, ten years ago? Um, more like six, seven. Have you been back? Have you seen it since the military took it over? No. Do you think they've changed it? I have no idea. What we needed was up-to-date intelligence. 
In a world without Google Earth and easy access to information, the Israelis are forced to improvise. Israel is very small and uh, we're surrounded by enemies. We have to think originally, we have to innovate to stay alive. Do we have any friends in Uganda? None we can trust anyway. Um, but I have an idea. Batzer now contacts a pilot who's also an agent from Mossad, the Israeli Secret Service. I asked him, could you possibly help us? And without hesitation, he said, yes. He went to Nairobi and rented a small plane. The agent files a flight plan to tour the area and heads west towards Lake Victoria. The operation was so secret that I only got permission last year from Mossad to talk about it. Then, over three days into the crisis, the hijackers break their silence. Terrorists holding the crew and passengers of an Air France plane in Entebbe Airport have announced their demands. They wanted Israel to release 52 Palestinian prisoners. They, want Germany to they also two demanded the release of 13 other prisoners held in jails they around want the world. Kenya to release, and finally, they're demanding $5 million in cash. These demands were clearly very extreme, and they wanted them met in two days. Two days, when they start killing hostages. That's insane. From a logistical standpoint, these demands are impossible. So we had to do something. You cannot wait until you have all the information you need. You have to act. The general feeling was that we don't have an option. So we moved from negotiations to a military operation. With a military operation now imminent, their Mossad pilot makes landfall directly over Entebbe Airport. He told the tower he had a malfunction and wanted to circle the airport and try to land. All the while, he's getting us critical intelligence. We see everything, including all the runways, the terminal, Uganda's uh, mix. Eventually, the agent told them the problem had resolved itself, and he returned to his mother airport. That's how we got the pictures. So at headquarters, we gave the intelligence to everybody and said, OK, come with whatever you have. What if you rent a boat in Kenya and sail a small group of commandos across Lake Victoria into Antebbe? Yeah, skip the boat. Why they start planning for a small force to eliminate the terrorists and release the hostages. Why don't we just drop paratroopers into the waters around the airport and then make an assault on the terminal? The only problem with that was Lake Victoria was filled with crocodiles. When you have a brainstorm, you put everything into the basket. But then, 80 hours into the crisis, they get news from Paris. Central authorities have revealed that terrorists holding the hostages from the Air France hijacking have released all the non-Jewish hostages. We learned that the terrorists did a selection and separated the Israelis and Jews and released the other passengers. News of this selection outrages Jews around the world. But for the Israeli forces, it discloses something completely unexpected. The hostages reveal they're up against a far more dangerous enemy. The four terrorists are not acting when alone. The guns were pointed at us. It told us that actually Idi Amin's force, guys, soldiers, are completely cooperating with the terrorists. We learned that everything Idi Amin had been telling the world was a lie. He was in league with the terrorists. It's a different story to come with a small group of experienced commando and kill four or five terrorists and release the hostages, then to come and fight against the, the Ugandan army. The non-Jewish hostages from the Entebbe hijacking arrive in Paris. We were surrounded continuously by heavily armed guards, both the PLO and uh, the Ugandan troops. Leaving the remaining 102 Jewish hostages in the hands of the terrorists 
and Ugandan dictator Idi Amin. So now we have two enemies. We have the terrorists and we have the Ugandan soldiers. We have to overcome both. The last thing the Israelis want is to find themselves thousands of miles from home fighting an entire army. Uganda, where But they quickly discover that the disturbing events of the last 12 hours have a silver lining. The terrorists did a big mistake. We started to get information from the hostages. So what we know at this point, that instead of four, we have 10 terrorists guarding the hostages. Now we have a picture of what's happening inside the terminal. How many terrorists are there? How many Ugandan military people are around? We have approximately 80 to 120 uh, Ugandan soldiers around the building. The team now scrambles to adapt to this completely different reality. More, which means we need to bring a larger force. Their first step is to find the commander of a new and little-known squadron in the Israeli Air Force. I was in a wedding in Haifa. I got the call from the chief of the Air Force. I still don't understand how he found me. And it's very unusual that the chief of the Air Force is calling a squadron commander directly. But you got to understand the situation. The Israeli Air Force was fighter pilots, all of them. And I was the only commander with the knowledge of how to fly our new C-130 Hercules. Can you carry 100? So they said, can you get there? How much cargo? 200. No problem. They can also carry armored vehicles. We knew that the only airplane that could do a tactical mission like this was the C-130. I love this plane. It has the fuel and range to bring forces that can be load quick and unload quick. So now they have the planes they'll need to carry this larger force from Israel down the Red Sea, then inland to Entebbe. But how do they fly there without being detected? The basic for every operation is surprise and concealment. Now we're talking about 76 and we didn't have peace with Egypt and definitely not peace with Saudi Arabia. So we knew we had to avoid the detection of the radar along the Red Sea from the Egyptian side and from the Saudi Arabia side. So we decided to, that we have to fly so very, very extremely low. We knew that the range of the radar in low level would not reach the middle of the Red Sea. But avoiding enemy radar means nothing if they can't see the Entebbe runway. So they target their landing for just after the last scheduled flight departs, when the runway lights should still be on. We knew that the airport was be still operational, but not busy. So what this you know, gets them to a point. But how will they land without attracting the suspicion of the control tower? I lived in an Air Force base, and I must tell you that an aircraft can land that night without immediately being attacked. Even if the tower see him on the radar, for instance, he can pick up the telephone and say to the Ugandan authorities, listen, somebody is landing at the airport and they will pick their telephone, and then they will pick their telephone and call the terrorist. It will take maybe 10 minutes, and we need that 10 minutes for the operation. But once an aeroplane is on the ground, it's like a sitting duck. So the problem now is how to get as quickly as possible from the plane to the old terminal two kilometers away. How can we approach the terminal without triggering a massacre? This problem got me thinking about when I was in Uganda and I'd see how their soldiers would automatically salute any passing limo because they know whoever was in it must be a high-ranking officer or even Idi Amin. It's at this moment that Muki Betzer has a brainwave. Is it run? Yes. Gonna have to do. My idea was to use a Mercedes and some Land Rovers to disguise ourselves as a military motorcade and drive from the plane to the old terminal. Now, if you're able to land that plane quietly without being recognized, then the enemy will think that it's, I mean, himself, who's coming to visit them. 
So we'll be able to get right up to the terminal entrance and surprise them. The whole idea behind it is to keep the surprise. And that was a very good idea. I'll take it to Rabin. So we have to think out of the box. We have to dare. We have to be able to defend ourselves, actually. It's as good of a plan as it gets. But there's a problem. We can't send our troops on a one-way ticket. The Hercules C-130 can only carry enough fuel to get them there. We have to find a way to bring them and the hostages back home. It's a big problem because we had to refuel the, the plane in some place around Uganda, and most of the countries there are enemies to Israel. So the idea was that while we are storming the building, some of the Air Force team will steal fuel from the Ugandans. I looked at the intelligence pictures and I saw where you can refuel your aircraft. But I was still really worried about it. It looked very risky. So risky that the Israelis sent a food barrage on a top secret backup mission to try and secure fuel in Nairobi. But even with the pieces of the plan now coming together, the IDF top brass still has one big worry. What if the runway lights are off? If you reach there and the runway is dark, what would you do? Go back. So we had to find a way to land without using the lights, which is a big, big problem. And we didn't have uh, the night vision capability. We didn't have all the instruments that they have now. So we were unplugged, as we say. Since they don't have the technology they need, they literally invent it. So we build in 24 hours the system that we hope will tell the pilot the distance from the runway and the level of the aircraft. The idea behind this system is that radar waves bounce back more slowly from the water and sand than they do from the hard surface of the runway. You can detect by radar where is ground, where is runway, and where is water. So this way you can navigate and you can plan your approach. But the question is, how accurate will their makeshift system be? That was a crazy system. It was very, very, very risky. The leadership of the Air Force and the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, did not think that we are able to land in the dark. They wanted a demo. So what I did was I picked up the big bosses to show them at night. Once the navigator sees the runway on the radar, he finds the angle of a normal approach. So he gave me the direction. Four, five degrees. I was under tremendous pressure that I will fail to convince them that because of me, the Israeli government cannot do anything except surrender to the terrorists. And then we have the generals breathing on my neck, almost touching me. Two degrees starboard. Another two degrees. Negative. I turn on the landing lights just in case. Hang on. I was about to land on the fence. I guess the radar picked it up stronger than the runway. I just told them, uh, let me try it once more. They said yes. It was an important test because the generals went back to the government, the Minister of Defense, the cabinet, and recommended we have a military option. But the politicians still don't give them final approval, which creates an even more critical issue. The team now can't reach the hostages before the terrorists' deadline. We have to gain time to get better prepared 
cooperation. We made it appear that we were negotiating with the terrorists in good faith, and they assumed we weren't going to launch an assault. So we used negotiations to delay the deadline to the 4th of uh, July. With this new deadline now just 24 hours away, the base floods with elite specialists and commandos. When I arrived in the morning, I saw people running from one place to another, and there was a feeling of a war starting. Yoni Chuzel, At that point, Sinai, the leader of our commando group, Yoni Netanyahu, returned from a mission in Sinai to take charge of the operation. As his deputy, I brought him up to speed on all the intelligence we had so far. Having assembled his team, Yanni Netanyahu orders the base locked down. We have disconnected all the telephones in the base, so nobody can talk. The secrecy of the mission was a key to success. Remember, surprise, surprise, surprise. Even our but in spite of the lockdown, pilot Natan Devere gets approval to make a quick trip off base. My wife was giving birth, so I went to the hospital and I could not tell my wife about the operation. I just tell her that I do not have time. She had to finish giving birth very fast, <laughs> which she did. I saw my daughter and I went back to the squadron. We've been out for 60 hours straight. It's coming together by the matter of one of Back on the base, the oh, team is I struggling with contradictory intelligence good, reports. But... The big issue is how many ways there are into the terminal. How many doors there is to the big hall. Unfortunately, at this point, we don't have any confirmation. Based on some of the days say it's three, some of them say two. But there are also some people that say that oh. there are only one door. Let's plan for three. If we're wrong, we'll just use whatever doors we find. On Friday night, we organized and checked each other's equipment. We made sure everything was okay. We also did something which was huge secret. They swear a local seamstress to secrecy and put her to work creating Ugandan uniforms. But they risk paying the ultimate price. If you are arrested with the uniform of the local army, you are considered a spy and you are executed on the spot. Well, I guess you better not get caught. The linchpin of the operation is the fake Ugandan motorcade. But the Mercedes is proving to be a problem. Hey, Marsha! The car wasn't in good condition. It was an old vehicle. We needed to go two kilometers. Even though we only needed it to drive from the plane to the terminal, its stalls were dead. To be like a Ugandan car, we put a license plate with Ugandan number, we put a Ugandan flag on the car. We were really fatigued and tired. We worked more than 60 hours without even thinking to sleep. At this point, Yoni went over the final plan. How the operation should be done and what every team in the staff should do. We will arrive on the first plane, disguised as Ugandans. Not we are the key of the operation. We have to storm the building with the hostages. And seven minutes later, there will be a reinforcement of light armored vehicles in the other Hercules planes. Once the terrorists have been taken down and the immediate area around the old terminal is safe, we will load the hostages and fly home, right? The troops are now committed to the work. mission. But the politicians working behind closed doors in Jerusalem are still afraid to greenlight something so risky. If it will be approved, it will be either the biggest failure of the IDF or the biggest success. In spite of not having approval, the commanders realize if they don't take off by 4 p.m., they won't be able to arrive before the terrorists' deadline. If you wait until they take decision, it's impossible to do it. So you have to start. On Saturday, a force of four Hercules C-130s prepares to take off from Sharm el-Sheikh, the southernmost point of land under Israeli control. We got the go-ahead, but without the final approval. We were facing an eight-hour flight from Sharm el-Sheikh. We needed all the fuel we could carry. The temperature is just awful. It's going to be over 100 degrees out there. Crazy. Or around 40 centigrade. They 
face two huge problems. The hot desert air provides dangerously little lift, and the aircraft is 40,000 pounds overweight. We never operate like this. Now, when you combine this weight to temperature of 40 degrees, it's like you lose an engine. This airplane will never take off. Go, go, go! And just imagine aborting a takeoff like this in that stage. This would be a national disaster and a shame for me for the rest of my life. So I pray to say, okay, sera, sera. Let's see what happens. Up, up, up. I stayed in the ground effect, in the cushion of air that you're flying over. And the whole crew were looking at the speed. They said, oh, you again, one knot, one knot, good, another knot. It was like a celebration to get five knots. And another knot, good, good. At the very end of the runway, we just got to the takeoff speed. There's no spare. We are very, very heavy. On the second Hercules, they're having the same problem. The one stage of the takeoff, I thought, are we going to fly to Entebbe or are we going to taxi? Because we never lift off. And then we finally took off. And the performance is limited. It's very hard in low speed to turn north because you have to take off against the wind. It's very difficult to fly so low. We flew by the radio altimeter because you cannot trust the normal altimeter in so level. And it was like 30 feet. 10 meters above the sea. I trusted the autopilot more than I trusted my hands. Remember, a movement of two millimeters will hit the water. Guys were everywhere, on hoods and even in the trunks of vehicles, anywhere where there was space. After three hours, the plane turns inland over Eritrea, where Israeli intelligence confirms there's no radar and climbs to 20,000 feet. During the whole flight, I didn't sleep even a second. I was very nervous. But uh, on the other hand, you don't really expect something will happen to you. When you're young, you don't think about it. You know your mission, you know there was uh, hostages there. You don't speak too much. Time is passing by, and suddenly you are looking on your watch, and you understand that there is no way back anymore because there is not enough fuel. With only one hour before landing, they finally get official approval for the mission. I didn't listen to it. I didn't care about it. I was pressing on. We got the signal about 20 minutes before landing. All the soldiers woke up and prepared for the operation. The visibility was reasonably good and we saw the runway at a very early stage. Getting closer. The navigator still initiates the radar vector approach in case the Ugandans turn off their runway lights at the last second. There's a big risk because we didn't know if they're waiting for us on the ground or not. We are coming to the most important point probably in our life, maybe in the history of the new country, Israel. The fear was to fail. down at the beginning of the runway. At that moment, I understood that that's it. It's not a game anymore, it's going to happen. I sense that it is okay. No shooting, no noise, but you don't know. At that final moment, I remembered a terrible hostage tragedy two years earlier. Because we lost the element of surprise, the terrorists opened fire on the hostages 
והיו לי כל מיני מחשבות בראש. This was my greatest fear. I stopped the airplane in the middle of the runway and then a few soldiers jumped from the doors with portable runway lights to mark a short runway in case somebody will switch off lights. Okay, let's go. Immediately I felt a terrible loneliness. Three vehicles in the middle of Africa. And uh, I, I remember feeling that within five minutes some of us will be dead. As we were approaching the terminal from a distance, I'm scanning everywhere, looking for the Ugandan soldiers. We knew there could be as many as 180 of them. Where are they? As we approached the terminal, an armed Ugandan soldier appeared. Nobody shoots until we give the word. Steady. He raised his weapon, but I knew that if we just kept going, he'd think we were a motorcade and wave us through. He won't do anything. That's what they're here to do. I told Yoni, leave it. He won't stop us. Suddenly, Yoni gave an order, shoot them. At the very, very same moment, uh, uh, Muki said, don't do it. Shoot! Don't do it! I shoot at him. The Ugandan immediately tried to get up and return fire. Another of our soldiers from the Land Rover behind us took him out. Go, 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 go! We lost the perfect surprise that we want to achieve. Immediately, the Mercedes at the front accelerated and we followed him. Take him out, take him out! Go, 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 go! We only get the order to jump out and we start to run to the main hall. Take him out, take him out! Take him out! Take him out! At that moment, I looked and I couldn't see my commander. I just thought that he is already ahead of me, so I decided to run as fast as I could. From out of the darkness, the Ugandan soldiers opened fire on us. At that time there was stories, shooting us, and there was exchange of fire. I took one out with a chest shot, it took only seconds. Then Moki uh, stopped for a while to exchange a magazine. Meanwhile, Joshua Shani taxis toward the underground fuel tanks to hook up his plane. And then I turned to the direction of the old terminal, so I was watching the scene. There were tons of bullets in the air. I could see my door wasn't there. This was a serious problem. We had to find another way in. At the same time, Amir Affair does see a way inside. I saw that Amir had found a door. He had see a terrorist inside taking aim. I saw the 47 shooting at me. I saw the whole glass shattering. I was right behind him. And without even thinking, I shot him three or four times. Suddenly, on my left, I saw two terrorists running at us. And only then I understood that I'm in a very great danger. I opened fire on him. Amir put up the edge. I came next to cover Amir and Amir. Amir and Amir. Amir and Amir. Amir and Amir. The hostages told us there were other terrorists on the second floor. I see that he threw a grenade to the room and uh, he got some fire and he shot into the corridor. There were several wounded, several dead, mostly the terrorists. 
I wouldn't like to be in this room again. These people were shot from very close distance and uh, not the nicest things to see. With the inside of the terminal now secure, the team prepares to move the hostages out to the plane. Yanni, we are ready to evac! But Yanni Netanyahu and his team are still in a firefight. Meanwhile, Natan Devere brings in the second Hercules, loaded with armored cars and reinforcements. It is exactly seven minutes since the first plane landed. And I enter final approach. Well, that's a good sign. The light is still on. And I saw the runway was still in light. You're on board. In the beginning of my landing, everything went dark. I just saw the flashlight that's number one left for me. I was on the ground, I was safe. We started to refuel, but my fear is that I will lose an airplane. Yoni, I need a C-trap. Yoni, do you copy? But Yoni doesn't answer. Yoni's been hit. Okay, Yoni's been hit. Hit? Where? How bad? He's trapped out front. Get them ready, but don't move them until you get the order. Understood? Outside, there was a lot of fire. We were shooting with the RPG rocket. I leave the terminal and I see Yoni lying unconscious. He has a terrible wound. Yoni, you stand, Yoni, you stand. I'm assuming command. Yoni, you stand, Yoni, you stand. I'm assuming command. Yoni, you stand, Yoni, you stand. I'm assuming command. Yoni, you stand, Yoni, you stand. I'm assuming command. Yoni, you stand, Yoni, you stand. I'm assuming command. Yoni, you stand, Yoni, you stand. I'm assuming command. Yoni, you stand, Yoni, you stand. I'm assuming command. Yoni, you stand, Yoni, you stand. I'm assuming command. Yoni, you stand, Yoni, you stand. I'm I hear from the radio, the Idi Amin soldier, start approaching the airport. I really wanted to get the hell out of there. It's then they get word that Ehud Barak's secret mission has secured fuel for them in Nairobi. So my decision, together with the ground commander, was to stop the refueling and to fly before we lose an airplane. Come on, come on. I give the order to evacuate. It's a hundred people, and we need to move very fast. Come on, go, 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 go! It's now or never. They have no choice. One of the French flight crew. I was wounded, so I took this young lady in underwear. I think they were red. And I put her on my shoulder and I said to myself, this situation of the brave soldier with the half-naked beauty and running between the bullets, I think it repeated in hundreds of war films that I'm the only one in the IDF who had the opportunity to carry such a beauty half-naked on my back. 103 hostages are hustled out to the plane. I tell my man uh, to use maximum firepower. think that you're in the Second World War, but uh, actually the, the reason for it was that we had to clear the whole environment. There was a lot of people inside this airplane, so one Uganda uh, soldier to just can destroy this operation. Our men shoot with heavy weapons. RPGs. Yeah. 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 And it becomes silent. It was quiet completely. There was no fire anymore. We knew we had to get out of there as fast as possible. So the airplane with the hostages left. They were safe. When I saw the silhouette of the airplane with the hostages taking off to Nairobi, I said, mission accomplished. The uh, runway was completely dark at that time, and we took off. With all but one of the Hercs heading to Nairobi for refueling, 
the Israelis have a final piece of business. And then we had to destroy the line of MiG-21s and uh, MiG-17. So that there is no counterattack from Uganda forces. Amateur Kafra is the last man to leave. I wasn't going to leave the Mercedes there. I said, forget it. The projected operation time was 60 minutes. The mission was accomplished in 59. As we started to taxi into the runway, I saw a glow of light behind me coming from the explosion of the mix. We were elated that the operation was a success. This is better. But we lost Yoni. Yoni. And all this happiness shut down like it was cut with an axe. On one hand, we lost uh, our commander, who was really an amazing person. On the other hand, we understood that we did something exceptional. After refueling in Nairobi, the team heads home to Israel. And on the way back home, the news explodes. First was the BBC. So I put the radio on the loudspeaker. It is being reported that there have been two hostages who were rescued with only two casualties. Now, when we hit Israel, we already knew that every single person in the country knows Hercules are coming. So we took advantage of it, we went a little bit low level, we waved, we did things that we're not supposed to do. So we had some fun, we enjoyed it on the way back. As the world greets the released hostages, the heroes of the operation return under a cloak of secrecy. At that time, it was a huge secret. I mean, nobody knew how we did it, and it was absolutely forbidden to identify us. But over the years, this incredible operation became a defining moment in Israeli history and sent a message to the world. It showed the international community that there is a way to fight terrorism. It was important as a deterrence to other terrorist organizations, and actually after 76, we didn't have, a, I believe, even one hijacking of an airplane. Going to Entebbe was important because it was a milestone for the soul of the nation. And when I got home, my father was there, sitting in the middle of the room. And my father lost his family in, in the Holocaust. And I looked at him, although I was exhausted and tired, I looked at him and I said, we are now involved in saving Jews which nobody did when he needed it, made him so excited and so happy and so proud that I said to myself, you did right, Shiki.